My name is Matthew Gates. I am an IPM specialist and the founder of Xenthanol Consulting, which deals with people's pest issues in agriculture. I'm often asked the question, how do aphids feed on plants? This video will delve into the ways that aphids detect, locate, and then check whether a host is suitable or not. Whether specialists or generalists, aphids locate suitable hosts through olfactory cues like attractive aggregation compounds from others of the same species or a specific and general blend of volatile organic compounds that can signal host or non-host status. As odor molecules dock with olfactory receptors in the antennae of aphids, they are able to orient towards a potential host and away from potential threats. The many ametidia that compose aphid compound eyes resolve shapes and forms poorly, but are sensitive to ultraviolet, blue, and green light spectra, which allow them to locate specific visual cues, like stems or leaves, and a small group of simple eyes called ocelli detect polarized light from the sky and nearby surfaces where light reflects, signaling verticality and the direction of the sky, which is obviously useful in flight. When an object that satisfies visual and olfactory cues is detected in range, aphids will make contact with the surface and engage in a probing behavior. If contact can't be established or the object cannot be penetrated, the aphid will disperse to find other potential hosts. On potential hosts, aphids use their piercing mouth parts to penetrate the wax cuticle and other tissues and probe for access to long tubes of plant sap called phloem sieve elements, using gustatory cues like the phagostimulant and main food source sucrose and other plant sugars, along with minerals, proteins, and free amino acids. Sometimes, an aphid will have to move between different veins on leaves to encounter a more ideal nutritional concentration, as sugar and amino acid content varies greatly based on light, tissue location, and plant age, among other things. If the host is recognized as acceptable, the aphid produces both a watery and adhesive saliva to neutralize plant immune response function and begin the digestion process of incoming sucrose shunted into the body at a very high osmotic pressure because phloem sap is mostly sugar produced from photosynthesis. This pressure allows the dissolved sugars to move from their source to their eventual sink in the plant, like roots, and means that aphids do not need to suck the contents under their own power, though they do use mandibular suction when imbibing from xylem water channels to dilute their high-pressure diet. Sucrose is the primary agent and gustatory cue that stimulates the feeding behavior in aphids, but its osmotic pressure is massive at the rates in which aphids feed, and they feed for longer periods in order to consume more if levels are low. Such a massive amount of sugar intake and osmotic pressure would cause an uncontrolled flux of water from the aphid tissues to the gut lumen and shrivel the aphid's body, yet they persist unfazed. How much sugar can aphids really handle? In feeding behavior experiments, simple membranes filled with mainly sugar water are accepted by aphids as a food source without any need to entice the aphid using visual or olfactory cues. Concentrations of sucrose tend to be artificially high, with both decades old and recent studies showing that aphids can feed on sources in excess of 34 degrees bricks, or 34% sucrose content by mass, with an osmotic pressure of 4 megapascals, or 580 pounds per square inch pressure. Comparatively, this is several times greater than the pressure of air in heavy-duty truck tires, and a sugar content thrice as much as the ratio in a 2-liter bottle of Coca-Cola, which is approximately 11.7% by mass. In these experiments, aphids are shown to stabilize incoming pressure, reducing it to around 1 megapascal, that of their body. Aphids do not desiccate from the extreme pressure imbalance of their sap diet because they produce copious amounts of two enzymes to break sugars down and retain osmotic homeostasis, mainly sucrase, which hydrolyzes sucrose to glucose and fructose, and transglycosidase, which synthesizes glucose-based oligosaccharides. Although processed, 
Much of these sugars are constantly voided as honeydew that becomes deposited below the aphid, which is a common source of sugar for sooty mold fungi, bacteria pass into substance, and other organisms. Sugar is the most important food source, but aphids must also acquire minerals and amino acids to produce proteins and other important substances. Minerals are mainly sequestered from plant sap, but aphids primarily rely on microbes, mainly bacteria like Buchnera and Serratia, that have existed in special cells called bacteriocytes for millions of years in various lineages to synthesize most of their essential amino acids. This reliance obviates the need for much in the way of the nitrate and ammonium that is taken up, processed, and translocated in plants. Entire gene families are devoted to processing nitrate and ammonia, which cannot be eliminated from the plant phloem on which aphids and other insects feed, utilizing processes such as the constitutive high affinity transport system, the inducible high affinity transport system, and the low affinity transport system, which are integral for photosynthesis and other functions. Aphids do not always exclusively feed on plants. Even some aphids like Megora visii are known to cannibalize other aphids, and the gall-forming aphid, Ceratoglyphinia cyracicola, is known to bite people, causing welts and rashes that last for multiple days in several cases. Paracletus semicoformis is an aphid that mimics the cuticular hydrocarbon scent composition of tetramorium ants, and this allows certain individuals to feed on their larvae. Regardless of host, aphids typically do not feed alone, at least not for long. Colonies are typically composed of entirely female live birth clonal offspring, which are themselves born pregnant, referred to as telescoping generations. Rapid development allows aphids to adapt to their plant hosts efficiently, and coevolution with host plants has existed since the Permian period around 250 million years ago which has intimately influenced plant immune response ever since, and likely before the common ancestor of aphids developed. Various toxins and volatile organic compounds can stymie aphid development by directly harming or interfering with the aphid's physiology, or by attracting organisms that do, like parasitoid wasps. Such olfactory signals can be lost in a cacophony of other compounds or lose their utility as an indicator for certain species if the signal is co-opted. Broadcast signals can even be exploited by other herbivorous insects, as well as aphids, attracted to distressed plants. On the other hand, like many symbioses, the parasitic nature of aphids can lead to mutualistic benefits over time, like vectoring viruses which kill competing plants but are asymptomatic in others, or by attracting guards in the form of ants, which cost the plant resources and sugar, but drive away or consume more harmful herbivores. Aphids account for more than half of documented plant virus transmissions. Some even estimate as much as 75%, but not all plant species are affected equivalently, even between individuals of the same species. By understanding the physiology, behavior, and ecology of aphids, Cultivators can disrupt their ability to ingress and make contact with their host plants. Aphid visual and olfactory senses can be disrupted by overwhelming them with decoy colors and scents that attract, repel, or confuse them, especially when combined with other methods of control, like biocontrol agents, traps, and physical barriers. Wipe this meme from the face of the earth. 